All right, so here we are for part two of the attitudes lecture. I think this part will be very short. Not really, no, I don't think so. About the same size. All right, one final topic to wrap up in terms of measuring attitudes. Okay, come on, pen. Here we go. Uh, the whole idea of obtrusive measures. So far, I've been talking about very obtrusive measures uh, in terms of attitudes. The Likert scale uh, and any other scales are very obtrusive in that people are very much aware uh, that they are uh, having their attitudes measured. So when you give someone a uh, Likert scale to measure their attitude about something, you can uh, basically be assured that that's what's going on is that you are getting an ex explicit uh, measure of their attitudes, or you're measuring their explicit attitudes. Uh, that's not their implicit attitude. And as we know, sometimes people's implicit uh, cognitions and their implicit attitudes will determine how they feel about things or how they'll behave. And so here we start to see a major problem with the measures that we've been talking about, these obtrusive measures. We're only getting one side of the story. We're not seeing what these implicit attitudes are. Uh, and a clear problem with that is that there's a presentation bias when we're using obtrusive measures. That is, since people know that we're measuring their attitudes, they will try to present themselves in a way that, number one, is comfortable for them and their uh, self-esteem, and number two, uh, in a way that they think we want them to as, as psychologists. So oftentimes, these explicit, uh, these obtrusive measure, measures, which give us these implicit measures of attitudes, will be very contaminated, uh, mainly by a person's uh, self-esteem or, or their expectations about what the researcher uh, wants. So we're not really getting, in many cases, the person's true attitude. So how are we going to do uh, go about doing that, that is getting uh, a true attitude? Well, most students will say a lie detector or a polygraph. And the lie detector does not work. And this is one of the big surprises. Uh, and one of the, in class, when we have in-class discussion, one of the most, lo uh, you know, uh, longest, uh, you know, parts of a lecture in this class where students are asking questions. It, uh, lie detectors, that is the polygraph, uh, doesn't work. Uh, in fact, research shows that by just being told that a polygraph doesn't work means that now you could go into a polygraph oper uh, operator's office and have a polygraph test and lie and pass it. That's all that it takes. And in fact, it's really because the polygraph has no way of measuring whether or not you're lying or not. A polygraph, the poly means several graphs, graphs. It's measuring several uh, biological, physiological measures from you. Heart rate, respiration rate, uh, galvanic skin response. Galvanic skin response uh, is, uh, you know, the electric, uh, electrical conductivity of your skin. Uh, the amount you're sweating changes that. So if you're aroused and you're sweating, then uh, your conductivity is low. And all those things measure your physiological state, not whether or not you're lying or not. If you're nervous or upset about something else, the lie detector will measure that you're lying, but you are not. So uh, you know, the courts have long known that lie detectors don't work. You, of course, know by watching the procedural uh, police shows that uh, lie detector results are not admissible in the court. Why? Because the courts know that they don't work. Uh, the NSA, the big spy uh, organization for the U.S. government, they don't use lie detectors to screen spies because they know it doesn't work. Uh, so you're saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, but I saw it on Maury Povich or I saw it on some TV show, somebody gave lie detector tests. 
If you watch the credits of those TV shows, you'll notice at the very end, uh, there'll be a little disclaimer saying that the lie detector test results were presented for their entertainment value only. And what they're saying is, yeah, we know that lie detectors don't work and we're only doing this for having a good show and it just doesn't work. And that doesn't mean that people use lie detectors and polygraph operators. And I'll explain how it's used normally and uh, you know why it quote unquote works. So let's say that you're working in a camera store and during your shift where like four employees are working, a $2,000 camera is stolen. Uh, and so nobody knows how, so the owner, uh, you know, is getting ready to fire everybody. Uh, and so what he does first is he calls in, uh, you know, a polygraph operator. And so what happens is, you know, you go in for your shift and there's another shift of workers there and you're saying, what? And the boss is there and he says, come to the back. And you go to the back and there's all the, your other shift workers sitting there apart from each other, by the way, and they're not social distancing. And uh, you're taken one by one into a back room where their polygraph operator is set up. And you know, he's in a suit, he looks official, he's talking like a cop, but he's not really. And uh, he hooks you up to this machine and he you know, goes through the whole rigmarole that you see on procedural cop shows. And, you know, did you, you know, is your last name Jones, you know, blah, blah, blah. And did you steal the camera on the night of the October 21st? Do you know who stole the camera on the night of October 21st? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's circling numbers on the graph paper. And then after it's over, he says, well, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, uh, looking at your results, it doesn't look good for you. Uh, and I'm going to have to tell your boss and it looks like you are lying when you said that you didn't uh, steal the camera. Uh, however, uh, I can do this. If you sign this uh, document here saying that you did steal the camera, your boss will let you resign uh, and uh, uh, you know he won't uh, file police charges with you. Uh, now, if you think about it, you know the, the polygraph operator does that to everybody. Uh, says the same thing regardless of the polygraph results because, you know, of course, it doesn't show anything. And so if you're innocent, you, of course, freak the heck out. And then the polygraph operator looks at you and says to himself, oh, this person is freaking the heck out. They're innocent. And then uh, the one person who says, okay, I'll sign it, well, we know who stole the camera. And that's all the uh, boss wanted to know. Maybe he's going to fire everybody on that shift, which most bosses will do, or maybe just the person who admits to it. We just don't know. And that's how uh, polygraph operators make their money. They don't have any ability to tell if you're lying or not. So if we can't use a lie detector, how are we going to determine what people's true or implicit attitudes are? Uh, one thing we can use is the bogus pipeline. And I love this, not just because the name bogus pipeline is just a wonderful name, bogus pipeline. So here's how it works. Uh, you're in the research pool. And many research pools, ours might sometime when we get, you know, studies that need it, will have pre-testing. And what that means is at the beginning of the semester, everybody in the research pool, all the intro psych students, uh, do a study in the research pool that's a pretest, and ask them questions to screen them for other studies. And if we're doing a bogus pipeline study, we'll put in some questions in the uh, you know screening uh, pretest, and questions about your attitudes, about what type of ice cream you like and if you're a Mets or a Yankees fan, and blah, blah, blah. And then a uh, couple months later or a couple weeks later, uh, you're called into the experiment, and uh, the researcher says, well, uh, we've, uh, you, know, you may have heard about the lie detector, and you may have heard in intro psych that the lie detector does not work, but we are developing a scanning technology that will detect when people are telling the lie or not, woo! And uh, we're going. We'd like to uh, validate it on you. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to hook you up to the machine, and then we're going to ask you some questions, and we're going to ask you to lie, and we're going to see if the machine can catch you. And so they hook you up to a very you know, realistic looking apparatus. Showmanship is everything. And then what they do uh, is they start asking you questions. And they, they say, you know, when they have like a green light and a red light, the red light means you're lying, the green light means you're telling the truth. And they say, okay, so, uh, you know, for the first set of questions, tell us of the truth. What's your favorite ice cream? Uh, chocolate. And a researcher in the back has your answers to the pretest, and they look up to see whether or not that's the truth or not. If it is, they push the button that turns on the green light. You're out there saying, oh my god, the green light's on, it knows that I like chocolate. And then, you know, later on, the researcher says, okay, for the next three questions, I'd like you to lie. Uh, you know, are you, a, you know, are you a Mets or a Yankees fan? And you say, I I'm a Yankees fan. And the researcher in the back sees that it says you're a Mets fan, so he presses the red button, and the red button comes on. And this starts to make you think, oh, this really works. Some subjects will then, like, want to, you know, get fancy. And so they're supposed to lie. Uh, but then, you know, uh, they'll say, well, what? No, I want to really see if this works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the truth. And they tell the truth, and the green light comes on, and now they're really convinced. And so now the uh, researchers can go on to the questions they really want to ask, which is, like, how many same-sex sexual relationships have you had in your life? Which is something that a lot of people, especially a lot of men, will not answer truthfully. However, uh, the bogus pipeline has made the person realize that if they don't answer truthfully, the red light will come on and embarrass them. So they realize that eh, they got to go through with it and they got to tell the truth. And as elaborate and uh, intense, uh, time intensive as it sounds, it does work. Uh, but that's the really the only obtrusive, that is the obvious method of measuring implicit attitudes, the bogus pipeline. Uh, there are other ways of measuring attitudes that are unobtrusive, that is, that are invisible or not obvious. So we're measuring people's attitudes without them knowing that we're measuring attitudes. And so uh, the first one is the lost letter technique, uh, where you just take a letter and you drop it on the ground and uh, you have it addressed to your address but then you put a different name uh, on the letter such as the uh, you know Bush for president I mean Bush that's how old I am the Trump for president campaign or Biden for president and then you take a hundred of these letters and you drop them around a neighborhood and you see how many get mailed back and that's a way of measuring the general attitude of the people in that neighborhood for uh, the two candidates. You're not measuring an individual's attitude, you're measuring a community's. And that's a very broad measure, but it, it does work. Another measure uh, that's unobtrusive, and this does measure the individual's uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, attitudes, uh, is called the ERP method. And ERP stands for Event Related Potentials. That is, when you are looking at a list of things and you know what the list is about, and then you run into something on that list that doesn't fit on the list, there's a brain, a, a brain wave that goes blip, or you can detect it very easily. Uh, and so these are brain waves, so all you have to do is put a, a, a you know, a sensor on your scalp. So what they do is uh, if you want to find out what you know whether or not Sony feels positively or negatively about something, you create a list of positive things and you know this from previously interviewing the person and you have positive things on the list and then you put your test thing in. And if you see the blip then you know that they were expecting a positive thing, but they found a negative thing. Or if there's no blip, then you know that the test item was seen as just like everything else, positive. Uh, 
Also, another way of measuring attitudes is with uh, facial muscles and also other muscles. Uh, that is, when you are exposed to something that uh, you like, your facial, muscle, facial muscles, which are used to smile, they will show a slight electrical potential along the nerves. Not enough to trigger the movement of the muscles, but enough to be measured. And so we present items to subjects and then we see where the electrical potential show up in the facial, mus facial muscles associated with smiling or the facial muscles associated with frowning. Likewise, the muscles in your forearm that, deter that are used to push something away from you or pull something towards you Yep, you guessed it. There's a slight electrical potential when you see something positive in the muscles that you use to pull something towards you. And if you see something negative, there's a slight potential in the muscles that you use to push something away from you. And then finally, there are cognitive methods of you know, which kind of are unobtrusive. Uh, the speed to evaluate an object is good or bad and we're talking about the implicit attitude test. And while you know that you're having your attitudes measured, the whole point of the IAT is that you can't consciously uh, affect the results without the IAT knowing. So this, the IAT is uh, an implicit measure of attitude or it's measuring an implicit attitude and we can kind of consider it uh, unobtrusive. Likewise, uh, ERP, uh, facial muscles, uh, these, you're still in the lab, you're still hooked up to machines, so you know something's going on, uh, but you may not know exactly what exactly is going on in terms of attitudes being measured. And uh, our final topic, is it our final, nope, our second to the final topic today is the link between attitudes and behavior, and now we come back to where uh, Gordon Allport started us off because the link between attitudes and behavior this is the this is the holy grail this is the thing where attitudes are a precondition of behavior if there's a strong link between an attitude and behavior and we measure the attitude first that means that the attitude is a precondition of a behavior all right so uh, the history of that begins with Richard LaPierre, a social psychologist or sociologist. In 1934, he traveled the country with a young Chinese-American couple. They were described as uh, attractive and very friendly, which is important. Uh, so LaPierre and the young Chinese couple went to 250 restaurants, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, lunch counters, uh, you know, hotels, motels, travel parks, uh, and out of the 250, the Chinese couple was turned away only once. That's because of racism. Uh, however, three months later, LaPierre mailed letters to all of those, uh, you know, establishments and said, oh, by the way, do you allow, you know, Chinese people to stay in your establishment? I'm thinking about staying there and, uh, you know, do you allow uh, Chinese people to stay there? I just want to know. 90% said no, they, they don't allow, uh, you know, Chinese people there. So, as we can see, the attitude is that they are fairly racist, but the behavior is almost perfectly non-racist. So back in 1934, LaPierre clearly demonstrated that this link between attitudes and behavior is very weak. In fact, uh, research up until today finds that the correlation, the average correlation between measures of attitudes and measures of behavior is only uh, 0.30. As you know, uh, correlations or Pearson's R's, they run uh, from minus one, meaning a perfect negative relationship, which we would hope we would not get anything like that in attitude research. 
to a zero, meaning no relationship at all between the attitude and the behavior, to a positive one, meaning a perfect relationship between expression of the attitude and expression of the behavior. And we would expect, if there's any relationship or any link between attitudes and behavior, we would expect to have a positive uh, correlation, and we do. Uh, however, the strength or the effect size, uh, anything below 0.3 uh, is considered a weak correlation. Uh, 0.3 to about 0.6 is considered moderate, and anything above 0.6 is considered strong. So the average correlation uh, between an attitude and a behavior is right at the threshold of being weak or moderate. So that's not really good news for the whole idea that attitudes are a precondition of behavior. And over the 80s and 90s, a great deal of research has been done on this. And what determines whether or not there is a link between attitudes and behavior are several specific situations or circumstances. And so what I've done in the next two slides is summed up those circumstances. Your attitudes will better predict your behavior when you're consciously processing rather than unconsciously processing information. That is, explicit attitudes will predict explicit behavior better uh, than implicit attitudes predict implicit behavior. Attitudes formed through experience will predict behavior better than attitudes formed through observation or belief. Uh, if the topic is of self-interest, that is, if it affects your life goals, uh, then it will have a stronger attitude behavior link than if there is no personal involvement. Uh, social identification. So if the attitude uh, deals with some part of your social identity, uh, if you are a, a Republican, then definitely that's part of your social identity. And well, not definitely, but then again, that means that your attitude about voting for, uh, you know, uh, Trump uh, will uh, correlate very well with your actual voting behavior. Uh, value relevance. That is. If the topic is of personal val is relevant to your personal values, that is the core things that you believe in, uh, then the attitude expressed will correlate more uh, with the behavior that is expressed. Attitude specificity: uh, the attitude to a, uh, commit a specific behavior at a specific time is more strongly correlated to a behavior than a general attitude at some time. So I ask you, will you recycle? And that's a general attitude. And that's not well, that's that expression of that attitude is not that well correlated with the behavior of recycling. But if I say, today, right now, that bottle you have now, are you going to recycle it? Then uh, that specific attitude will be strongly related to your behavior of recycling. Uh, when behavioral control is high, uh, you're going to be more likely to see a strong attitude behavior link. Behavioral control is your ability to do the action if you wanted. So I offer you uh, this little uh, interesting and topical question. Uh, which situation do you have more behavioral control in? Whether you will vote or not in the election on November 6th, or who you will vote for. And which do you have the higher level of uh, behavioral control? And so uh, are you going to be more likely, if you say you're going to vote uh, on November 6th, are you going to be more likely to have a, a strong relationship between that attitude and that behavior? Or are you going to be more likely to have a strong relationship between people uh, who say they're going to vote for Biden versus Trump and who they actually vote for? And then social norms that support a behavior will cause a higher attitude behavior link than if there are no norms supporting that behavior. 
So we're more likely uh, to uh, recycle because of the behavioral norms of going green or being green is important or, or turtles with uh, straws in their stomachs. And that's it for uh, the link between attitudes and behavior. And then our final topic for today, persuasion. Persuasions are efforts to change other attitudes through the use of various kinds of messages. And here, uh, advertisements are, of course, a classic example of persuasion. Okay, so one of the theories that I like to focus on is the cognitive processing uh, theory that underlies persuasion, the elaboration likelihood model. And this model uh, posits two different cognitive systems which underlies attitude change. One is what they call the systematic route to pro processing, and the other is the heuristical route to processing. The systematic route to processing involves careful uh, consideration of the message content and ideas. And during systematic processing, the argument strength matters. Because what happens is you think about the attitude, uh, you think about your attitude, you think about the persuasive message you heard, and then you analyze the message, uh, message's content. And if the argument strength uh, makes sense to you, uh, then that's going to be more likely to change your uh, opinion or change your attitude. And so this is known as the central route or the systematic route or systemic route to persuasion where you are considering the content of the message and if the message is a stronger, better message, you're going to be more convinced by it and you're going to change your attitude more. Uh, However, the other route is the heuristical route, uh, the same from cognition heuristics. And this involves the use of simple rules or mental shortcuts, uh, such as argument strength, or you know, and in this case, argument strength doesn't matter. And so we call this the perceptual route to persuasion or the heuristical route or heuristical processing. So what's going on is that we're either processing information systematically along the central route and, or heuristically along the peripheral route. And according to the uh, elaboration likelihood model by, uh, developed by Petty and Sicipio, uh, we receive a persuasive message and then uh, we will take the uh, peripheral route or the central route based upon two important things. First off, message importance. If the message is individually important to me, I will pay attention to it and I will process it centrally. Why? Because it's important to me. Uh, you know, if somebody starts talking about, you know, fires in uh, California, that's unimportant to me, so I'm not going to pay attention to it. Uh, however, if we, I see the mayor on the TV talking about COVID, I'm going to pay attention to that. You better believe it. And so I'm going to carefully process the information. Uh, the other determination about whether or not the central or peripheral route is going to be used is our processing capacity. That is, consciously, explicitly, do we have a high level of mental capacity, capacity available at that time? Or can we make it so? So if I'm thinking about other things, and remember, implicit processing capacity is two or three channels or two or three things. If I'm thinking about two things or three things, I'm already at my limit. So even if the message is important to me uh, and I am thinking about other things or doing other things, I may not have the processing capacity. So therefore, even if it is important, I'm going to be processing it. Ooh. Even if it's important, I'm going to be processing it down here in the peripheral route because I just don't have the capacity to process it up here in the central route. Because really the central route is more explicit 
and the peripheral route is more implicit. And you should have guessed that from some of the things I was saying. Uh, heuristic is of course a dead giveaway. And so then, uh, as I've said before, along the central route, attitude change depends upon the strength of the argument. And I have a cat hair stuck in my mouse, so it's not working. There we go. Uh, and then what happens along the heuristical route or the, uh, percept uh, the peripheral route, attitude change depends upon the heuristical cues or the uh, persu persuasive cues which trigger heuristical processing. And so what are these heuristical uh, cues you ask? Well, somebody who uh, is an expert on this or at least did part of their uh, you know, PhD comprehensive exams on attitude change will let you know. Uh, so uh, examples of heuristics uh, in terms of heuristical change, those associated with the source of the persuasive message, that is, who's giving the message. Authority is a cue for heuristical change. Greater authority leads to greater attitude change only if you're processing heuristically. Greater power of the speaker, uh, that is, if this person has a great deal of power or money, then they will cause greater attitude change. Uh, greater credibility, trustworthiness, experience, or expertise. Greater attractiveness causes greater attitude change. And more similarity to the target causes more attitude change only on the heuristical route. And elements of the communication, repetition. The more the argument is repeated, the number of times, the more heuristical attitude change it will cause. If the person appears to be not interested in influencing your attitude, uh, that will cause more attitude change. The length of the argument is a heuristic uh, cue. The number of points, regardless of their quality, uh, is a heuristical cue. And fear appeals, that is using fear uh, to get people to change their uh, you know, attitudes is a heuristical change only if you provide information on how to avoid the negative outcome. That is, you know, uh, you know a heuristical cue is something like if you don't brush your teeth, you're going to get, you know, cavities. Uh, that's a fear appeal. And if you're not processing consciously, that will cause attitude change only if you say, and you avoid cavities by brushing your teeth. So you have to give them the information about how to avoid that. And if you want, you know, all of the heuristical changes are relatively short term. And so if you want to involve some, if you want to get some long term attitude changes, you need to use the systemic or central processing uh, route. And you need to give people strong arguments which engender positive thoughts and feelings when processed. And that will cause. Uh, positive attitude change that will last. And uh, that's it for the prep lecture. You've got a couple videos, other videos to watch before class, and a couple things to consider before class also. I'll see you in class.